Thank you, Lord. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Jesus. I believe we're going to have a significant time together this week and um, get the joy of being with you tomorrow night as well. So, amen. There's two announcements before we dig into the word today and challenge you to go deeper. First is you have a personal invitation. No, no, no. We're going to call it a challenge from Mr. Golan Lindsay and myself. Now, he doesn't know this yet. He just knows that at 6.30, we'll be hitting the gym for a workout, okay? What he doesn't know is that I came up with a team competition, so we're gonna, I'm gonna, it's gonna be the old men versus the young radicals. Now you can join in if you're older also, but it's gonna be teams of, of two, and it's all gonna be body weight, so everybody can do it, okay? As long as you're in shape, we have no heart attack insurance or anything like that here on campus. So 6.30, this will, this will be our workout for the semester. If you want to hit a workout or if you just want to observe or referee to make sure nobody's cheating, we'll be hitting it at 6.30, okay? But remember what my wife told me last year. She said to me, you can't work out with these guys in their 20s because it's not safe for them. <laughs> All right, so I just turned 69. So if you can't keep up with me, you are in trouble, right? So 6.30, all right? How many have joined me in previous workouts? There we go. All right, some champions here. Okay, awesome. The other announcement is that uh, our school, it's now just an online school, uh, many years ago birthed a missions organization, 25 years ago, Fire International. So that supports our grads all around the world and, and other missionary families that we work with. Uh, Karen David has been on the mission field in Mexico for 25 years. How many here, Spanish is your first or second language? Raise your hand, okay, awesome, all right. And how many are from Mexico? Okay, uh, Karen has an amazing ministry there, uh, helping uh, women and girls, girls and young girls that have been trafficked and abused. And she's looking for, for a right person to join her. And uh, she's going to make a quick announcement now, just letting you know who she is. She'll be here to stick around after if you want to talk with her at noon. Also, our third-year coordinator. Yes, if, all right. Come on. If you want to connect with him, if, you, if you're unable to meet Karen. But Karen David, come on up here and greet everyone. Buenos dias. Dr. Brown quiere para mí hablar en español todo el tiempo, pero no. <laughs> Porque español es mi segundo idioma y pues yo voy a hablar en inglés. ¿Está bien? <laughs> so yes, he, it's a safe home. It's not an orphanage. Um, we've been open for six years and um, I need some help. I did not plan on going into the ministry um, by myself, but while I was there just six years ago, my husband lost his mind and he chose to walk into the world and, and left Mexico. And the Lord said to me very specifically, Karen, you have the choice. You have children, you have grandchildren, you can go back or you can stay in this calling. And he was with me either, either way. And I knew that I knew that I needed to, to stay, that I wanted to stay. So I'm there, and I have staff, but I don't have anybody really working along, alongside me. Um, you know that the Mexican culture, the American culture raise their children differently. So sometimes I'm like, I just want somebody who thinks like I do. <laughs> so in raising children. So I invite you to come visit. I'm not asking you long term right now, but I would love to have visitors if you want to do a week, if you want to do a month. Um, we can work that out. We can be flexible. So it's amazing working with the girls. Um, I have one particular girl who did not want anything to do with Jesus. She wouldn't sit in the room with us at first to worship. She would sit on the side and just observe. And um, by the end, by before she left um, to go with family, she 
was walking with Jesus. She was praising Jesus. She was one of the ones that was more active in worshiping Jesus. And then when she went to her place, she met another girl and, and brought that girl to, to the Lord. So that's the goal is to bring these girls into salvation with Christ, into re being released from their trauma and walk in abundant life. And I need help with that. I would love you to come visit us. Thank you. Uh, just what have some of these girls been through? Give us a typical example. Okay. Um, one of our girls and her sister, their mother was, and her boyfriend were, um, these are, these are the stories hard to talk about, but they were training them to be prostitutes on the street. So it's sexual abuse, but it's also, it's more exploitation. So a lot of, lot of children in Mexico, males and females, have been sexually abused by their family members, but this is a little bit step further, training them to be the money winners for the family. And what are the age ranges? That I have are, I accept girls that are three years old up to um, 13. And yes, I've had three-year-olds, just absolutely disgusting, but they need us. They need us to, to parent them and love them with the love of Christ. And when, once they're 13, they do not have to leave. They're not kicked out. It's just that if they are learning and they're growing, they have the, the choice to stay with us until, until whenever, even when they're 18, if they want to stay and work with us or they want to go to college, whichever, we provide that for them. All right, awesome. <laughs> All right, so Karen will be here right when we're done at noon. All right, if you're unable to meet with her, but you want to find out whether it's short-term or long-term, then go through our beloved third year and Hispanic ministries coordinator. All right. And um, I believe God will bring the right people at the right time. Thank you. Thanks. Praise God. What's the name of the ministry? Treasure House. Treasure House. I have newsletters. All right. She's got newsletters to give you as well. And you can connect digitally. All right. So, yeah, let's, let's get some folks down to, to serve these young ladies. That's, that's ministry. Amen. Let's pray. Abba, we love you, and we're here for you. And we ask you, Lord, to speak to us as your children so that we can glorify you, whatever the cost, whatever the consequence. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I want to speak to you today about something of critical importance for the rest of your lives, regardless of what God has called you to. And in our American culture, and with a lot of well-known ministry names, and then in a school like this where you have so many leaders, well-known people come through, it's easy to think that God calls us to be big or famous or celebrities or somebodies. Whereas the reality is, in God's kingdom, there are servants, there are no celebrities. So I, I wanna make a deposit in you again. Last time we talked about serving God by life or by death. Today, I want to make a deposit in you whether you are called to be a social media influencer with 10 million followers, whether you are called to be the president of the United States, whether you are called to die as a martyr, whether you're called to be a church planter, or to live sacrificially in Mexico, helping girls who have been abused. These are things that are important to remember. And what I'm going to talk to you today depositing you today is, is very different than the typical grain of the American gospel mentality. I've often said that the, the American gospel that we preach these days, when you hear it in kind of popular form, is this is who I am, this is how I feel, and God is here to please me. And the biblical gospel is the exact opposite of that. This is who God is, this is how he feels, and we're here to please him. Many times we think of ministry as something that makes us bigger or better or gets us attention or gets us known, and we measure the way the world measures. But remember, Jesus said that the first will be last and the last will be first. So uh, you'll have access to this entire PowerPoint. Feel free to take pictures of the slides as they come up. Uh, we'll have some scripture, but a bunch of quotes I want to share with you, starting with the words of Paul. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he was dealing with wrong attitudes, 
because the Corinthians were really enamored by the, the superstars, the super apostles, powerful ministries, eloquent. Oh, they had it together. And that, that really influenced the Corinthians. It would be like if, if someone came in here, you know, dressed to the max and, and, and driving a Porsche and, and, you know, 30 million Instagram followers. It was like, wow. And someone else comes in kind of limping because they've been tortured and they can't talk well because they don't speak English well. That, and their only testimony is what Jesus did for them in prison. And kind of like, ah, he's not cool. That, that's, that's almost the way the Corinthians were. So Paul's rebuking them, and he says, already you have all you want. Already you've become rich. You've begun to reign, and that without us. And he said, how I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we might also reign with you. In other words, that would be great, but that would mean Jesus has already come and set up his kingdom. We wish that was the case, but that's not the case yet. We're still in this world. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. Let's say your city, your ruler had just won a big military victory and now you're coming back with all the captives. And the ones that were gonna die, they, they'd be the last ones. And Paul's saying, it seems to me that's where God's put us as the apostles. I'm Apostle Brown and powerful man of God with an amazing... No, Paul says, no, we're like the apostles, we're the end. We're like the ones being brought to, to die in the arena. We, who the apostles, have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. This was the ministry for Paul, all right? And Paul said, follow me as I follow Jesus. Not that we can't have possessions in this world, but in terms of being big shots, superstars, celebrities, you are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. This is not what we envision when we think of the call to ministry. You know, picture someone prophesies over you. I see the Lord has called you. I see an anointing on your life. The hand of God is on you. We're like, oh, we have a big ministry. I have a big church. Big income. Big following. You might. If God can keep you humble enough and close enough to the cross, he might trust you with that. In which case, if he does, you could care less about any of it. Only care about pleasing him. But it could be his call is for you to labor in obscurity. Could be his call is for you to, to devote yourself to making money to donate millions to missions and nobody ever knows your name. Could be his call for you to just die as a martyr. James Alexander Stewart got called to preach as a young man in Scotland and uh, uh, he became famous as a boy preacher. And in those days, gospel was more popular on a social level for the whole world because there were more Christians in Europe and America. And he was approached by Columbia Records. They had a boy gospel singer. And now they wanted a boy gospel preacher and they said, if you'll sign a contract with us, we will get your messages out. It would have been on album, if you ever heard of those things, right? We'll, we'll get your message out around the world. And he thought, what an incredible opportunity. This, this is God, right? And God convicted him that he was trying to become a professional evangelist. And that's kind of the model that many of us know. It, this is how you bring in the money. This is how you get the system to work. This is how you develop it. And it's a business more than ministry. So, so listen to what Stuart said. And God used him mightily, powerful rallies, especially in Eastern Europe, great outpourings. He said, I was once told that I would never be a very popular evangelist because I did not sufficiently sell my personality. Oh, the shame. Our business is to magnify the Christ of God and not to fling about our personalities. 
Dr. Herbert Lockyer, in pointing out the peril of man worship in evangelism, says, if a man is, or woman is somewhat attractive, blessed with a fascinating personality, and with power to influence multitudes, that man is often sought after rather than the master. Now, now see, here's the deal. We're in a generation now where anybody can get a message out through social media. You don't need a publisher. You don't need a channel. You don't need a backer. Right? You can get your message out. And sometimes you have to be creative. And how can you draw people in and, and clickbait and, and things like that? And, and you kind of measure effectiveness by likes or shares or, or something. But all that can be a complete trap and have nothing to do with Jesus. Nothing to do with the gospel, nothing to do with ministry. It can be entirely flesh. When I started doing radio, which was in 2008, five days a week, live talk radio, before I started, my wife Nancy said something to me. She said, this could be very dangerous. And I knew exactly what she was talking about. I'm a talker. I like to be challenged, like to debate, like to go back and forth, can tell stories. In other words, I could potentially have a good radio show, a successful radio show, and it has nothing to do with God. I, I mean, I'll talk about God, I could talk about the Bible, but it doesn't mean I was anointed. It doesn't mean lives were changing. Just because something is successful doesn't mean God's blessing it. Just because something reaches a lot of people doesn't mean God's in it. I mean, you think, think of the, one of the, the best known names associated with the gospel today. I don't know who, who the people would be that would come to mind, but I mean, really well known online. So I've got, like my Facebook page, I have 585,000 people. That's a decent amount, but there are people with millions and millions, right? On Instagram, I don't know what the best known social media influencers have, millions and millions, but compare them to like a world football star, like, like Messi or something, or how many followers he has, or some worldly star like the Kardashian family. Are, are, are they doing more for God because they have more people following them? <laughs> I always take the, the biggest Christian influencer out, and they're tiny compared to worldly influencers, but what does that have to do with God? The most influential one might be someone that doesn't use social media, that is just making disciples somewhere in private, an underground church, you never heard their name, and on the day we stand before God, all of us that have names and followers and all, like, like we're at the end. And these ones we never heard of are the ones making a difference. Now, here's the deal. Numbers do matter in the right way. So the book of Acts records 3,000 saved at Pentecost, right? And then a couple chapters later, it says that the number's grown to 5,000. So numbers matter in terms of souls. If there was one person here we can only train one person, but if there's seven or 800, we can train seven or 800. That's wonderful, right? But numbers in themselves don't prove anything. Numbers in themselves don't necessarily mean effectiveness. For example, you, you might draw, you may have a fast food restaurant and, and feed thousands of people every single week, but it doesn't mean what you're feeding them is nutritious or helpful. Let's keep going. Ivy Nepresh said this, one of Evan Roberts' severest trials, so he was used in the Welsh Revival, 1904, 1905, just 26 years old when the spirit fell. One of his severest trials during the revival was his being the object of men's worship. A friend of his once told me of finding him lying on the floor, crying to the Lord to bring this to naught so that all the glory should go to God alone. Someone made this comment to me the other day, we were made to give worship, not receive it. And when you receive worship, it destroys you. Hey, come on, it's human nature. You want people to recognize, oh, did it, you put out that podcast, that was really cool. You wrote that book, you sang that song, kind of like it. Matthew 23, Jesus rebukes the religious leaders and says, you love to be called rabbi. That's kind of cool, you know, at the airport and someone comes, Dr. Brown, I felt you, it's wonderful. That can make you feel good. That can appeal to the flesh. But if the goal is, hey, praise God, we're reaching more people for Jesus. Got nothing to do with me, but praise God, we reach another person for Jesus. Wonderful. But if it's 
wow, I'm kind of feeling good about myself. It's a trap. It's a trap. But it's so easy today to fall into it because we measure everything by likes and following and response as opposed to lasting fruit. Listen to what Tozer said. There are many great lessons for us in the worship and reverence. Bless you. That was, that was a, hey, listen, if you're going to sneeze, sneeze, right? Ask if you're going to do it. That's scriptural. No, that's scriptural. I got a scripture for that. You think I'm, I got a scripture for that. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart. There you go. You're okay though, right? You can hurt yourself with a sneeze like that. Okay, good. All right, let's, let's try to get back to A.W. Tozer. There are many great lessons for us in the worship and reverence of the heavenly seraphim, these angelic beings Isaiah described in his vision, Isaiah 6. He said, I notice they covered their feet and they covered their faces. Because of the presence of the holy God, they reverently covered their faces. Reverence is a beautiful thing, and it is so rare in this terrible day in which we live. He died over 60 years ago. He'd be more grieved today. He said this, but a man who has passed the veil and looked even briefly upon the holy face of Isaiah's God can never be irreverent again. There will be a reverence in his spirit. And instead of boasting, he will cover his feet modestly. Even if he's been somewhere, instead of coming home and bragging about it, chances are he'll cover his feet. Now, this is, this is pretty intense stuff. And we're all going to receive it at different places in our lives. In other words, this, this stuff still speaks to me in, in my journey 52 years in. So it's going to speak to us in different ways depending on where we are. It's not to say we can't glorify the Lord for what he did. You come back from a trip and you're boasting in the Lord and excited to tell people about Jesus. But, but often the boasting is the boasting about me, what I've done and how God uses me. And Often I'll hear of someone that's had all these alleged heavenly encounters you know, they've been taken to the third heaven. They've been in the presence of God. They've had these face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus. And you meet them personally, and they act like jerks. They're fleshly. They use carnal humor and think, whatever you're talking about, you didn't meet face-to-face -face with Jesus because you don't have those encounters and come out so fleshly and carnal. One of my grads said to me some years ago, he said, why is it that people that claim to spend like 50% of their time in the third heaven are some of the most fleshly people you've ever met? Because they're not really encountering it, maybe in their mind and their imagination. But when you encounter God, you just read through Scripture, even in the New Testament. Be it Peter encountering Jesus in a boat, and when he sees his miraculous power, they're out in the boat, he says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Or John, the one that was so close to Jesus, right, the disciple whom Jesus loved. When he encounters the risen Jesus in Revelation 1, he falls down like he's dead. Somehow, our encounter from God is not very deep if it doesn't change us. If it doesn't profoundly impact us. If we've really encountered, and you know what I'm talking about. You, you walk carefully. You walk with a limp. Listen to what D.H. Dolman said. I'm only a wick. So in a candle, a wick, the little part that burns in the middle. I'm only a wick. With many of us, it takes a long time to learn this lesson. It is only when the wick is soaked in oil that it can burn. If you wish for the fullness of the Spirit in order that your church should be crowded or people flock to hear you, the Holy Spirit cannot work through you. If people begin to talk about the wick, there is generally something wrong with the burning. When have you ever lit a candle and talked about the wick? Maybe it's a fragrant candle and you smell it or it's a candle that gives light. That's what you notice. It's the burning. It's the fire that's produced. 
If the attention is on the vehicle, the vessel, the individual, then something's wrong. So God works through us, and he works through our personalities, and he works through the unique ways he made us. He may have gifted you to sing or play an instrument in an incredible way. And when you do sing and when you do play, people will be drawn to you. But if your heart's right, ultimately they'll be drawn to the Lord. Maybe you're an amazing speaker or a communicator. you just got a charisma. People want to follow you. But if you're really walking with Jesus, it's just going to happen. They're going to be drawn to him. You know, in Acts 20, when Paul was warning the elders in Ephesus about these false disciples, false apostles that would come, he said, they will draw men after themselves. And that's the challenge that, that somehow in our ministry, the attention has to go to the Lord. You can put on a false humility, don't look at me, look at him. You know, we can say the words. It's not saying the words, it's having that in the heart. When you're alone with God, you say, Lord, I want all attention on you. Lord, if, you're, Lord, if you'll entrust me with a big platform, if you'll entrust me with, with reaching many people, because some of you, you have that call. Some of you, that's not your call. Right? Some of you, your call is, is to go in a very different way and to be out of the public eye or to, to do things in a, in a smaller way, training, equipping, etc., or to be in, you know, called to serve in some other parts, ministries. It could be called to serve administratively or other things. But, but others, if you're called to have some kind of platform and reach lots of people, God showed me early in my, my life I was called to, to reach lots of people, then there's got to be something deep in you that only has one desire, Jesus, you get the glory. Jesus, you get the glory. William Carey is called the father of modern missions. Went to India, was mightily used by God in the 1700s and became kind of a legend in his own time. He was a shoemaker, self-taught, but ended up translating the, the Bible into numerous languages, ended up working with more than 30 Indian languages and dialects, became a professor, and just was this legend. And as Carey was getting older, he heard people talking about William Carey, William Carey, William Carey, Carey, William Carey. And he got upset. And he calls some of his friends together. He said, I keep hearing you talk about Carrie. He said, when I'm gone, don't talk about Carrie. Talk about Carrie's Savior. And, and friends, there's a subtle thing in us where we want the praise. Yeah, we want to talk about Jesus, but we want that praise too. I'm not talking about the encouragement of good job, well done. That, that we want to hear from the Father. And that can be encouraging. And when, when we hear people contact us and let us know the ministry touched them or God used us to touch them, a book or a message or something. We're grateful to God. We appreciate that. But you gotta kill that thing. That you wanna be the per you wanna be the big shot, the star, the one people look at, talk about. You know, David Wilkerson once confessed this preaching at Times Square Church in the, in the 90s. He said that he preached a message at a convention and, and then after the message, you know, big message, a lot of people there, he's going to go back to his room to be alone with God. He's going to be alone with God, not around the crowds. But he sent some of his people out. He actually confessed this. He sent some of his people out to kind of mingle with folks afterwards to hear what they were saying about his message. I mean, the flesh wants to do that. What are they saying? Did they like it? It's one thing if you're trying to get critical input. I know God gave me this word. Did it hit home? I hope it hit home. I hope the people received. And, and you're checking in, in that way. It's another thing. Are they saying good stuff about me? Did they like that story? Are they praising me? That's the flesh. And hear me, if you really want to be used by God, the quicker you kill that, the better. The quicker you recognize it, the better. George Whitfield powerful evangelist in the 1700s, maybe the greatest preacher of his era. He became a legend when he was in his 20s. And he used to say, let the name of Whitfield perish that the cause of Christ may live. Let the name of Whitfield perish that the cause of Christ may live. I was praying that literal prayer for myself one day. It was in the early 1990s. I had worked with my friend Sid Roth to put together study notes for the front of what was gonna be a Messianic Bible. And it was 
it was going to answer Jewish objections to Jesus and give some keys for messianic, understanding messianic prophecy. Now, by the way, there's something subsequently I've been involved with that's a whole different universe in terms of work and putting something out. But this was, this was the first time. So that, you know, I've written now over 1,500 pages of answering Jewish objections to Jesus, but this was just the beginning. The first 50, 60 pages I had written, I was just, and, and there seemed to be an anointing and grace, I mean, keys to understanding Messianic prophecy, things I'd reflected on for 20 years. So most of the notes in the front of the Bible were written by me. And it was really high quality stuff that the Lord had given me. So I'm on my knees praying. I'm literally praying that prayer with my name. Lord, let my name perish that the name of Christ may live. And the phone rings. So it's the, in the days before caller ID, you couldn't see who it was. Physical phone. Any of you ever seen a physical phone plugged into a wall? Yeah, okay. And I sensed the Lord tell me, go ahead and answer. In other words, even though you're praying, go ahead and answer. So it's Sid. He said, Sid. He said, Mike, we got the Bible in our hands. He said, it looks great. He said, so I, I, I've got good news and bad news. I said, go ahead. He said, the good news is the Bible looks amazing. It's beautifully produced. It's really, really nice. I said, great. He said, what's the bad news? He said, well, you know, everyone has notes up front. You have most of them. He said, the names for the other contributors are there, but somehow we left your name out. <laughs> so what am I going to do, complain? I've just been praying that very prayer. And he calls me to say that everybody's name is there, but your name got left out. Some years later, I was at a big rally in England, and one of the speakers got up and happened to give credit to one of my colleagues who was there. For everything I had done, he got the thing confused, and he gave credit to my colleague for all these amazing things that he had done. It's supposed to be me who got the credit. I went back to my room. I remember I was in a hotel. I was staying in room 666. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember going in the room, and I, I, I just got on my knees, and I was talking to the Lord. And I said, Lord, is, is this my flesh? Am I so weak? Am I so carnal? Am I such a baby that I want to get the credit? And it just doesn't seem right, though, that I don't get acknowledged for things I've done. So I just pour my heart out to the Lord. I go downstairs to the lobby of the hotel, and there's a, an older colleague, a friend of mine, haven't seen him in a while. And what is he holding? He's holding that Bible. That very Bible, that Messianic Bible. And he said to me, Mike, have you ever seen this? Like, have I seen it? I wrote all the introductory quotes. What do you mean, have I seen it? I was part of it. I got left, my name got left out, but I thought, that's the Lord. I mean, of all times, for that moment to happen, that was the Lord. The nice thing, having the name Michael Brown, is that there are a million Michael Browns out there. And the best known Michael Brown is, unfortunately, the teenager that got shot and killed by police in Missouri a few years ago. In fact, there were people who hated me that when they saw the name, you know, Michael Brown killed, they were upset that it wasn't me. Not everybody likes me. You have to remember that. Let me, let me share a few more quotes with you. Here's another quote from James Stewart. The mightiest work the Holy Spirit did through Dwight L. Moody in Great Britain was in small groups of five or 600 people, not in the large audiences of 20 and 30,000. One may well be afraid of the crowds. Remember, Stuart preached to crowds as well. Look at this. We cannot journey far with God unless we are saved from numbers. That's a heavier quote than you might realize. 10 years from now, 30 years from now, you'll feel the weight of it. We cannot journey far with God unless we are saved from numbers. It is sadly possible to think more of numbers than of Christ, who in the days of his earthly ministry went not only to the cities, but to inconspicuous places proclaiming the word. You cannot measure your ministry by numbers. You cannot measure your ministry by finances. You cannot measure your ministry by popularity. One of our grads from our school in Pensacola was with us during the revival is Daniel Kalenda, who took over Reinhard Bonnke's ministry. When he was still in his 30s, he had led more than a million people to the Lord in Africa. And I was just on the phone with him a couple of days ago, and they were doing something experimental 
just doing meeting after meeting over the period of a month in Nigeria. And he said, yeah, the crowds weren't what we're used to. He said, maybe 80, 90,000 a night, you know, small crowds, 80, 90,000 a night. That's, that's not a bad sized crowd. I mean, there's, there's one famous video in Lagos, Nigeria, where over a million people respond and, and pray the sinner's prayer with Reinhard Bonnke. Several million people in a single meeting. That's glorious if God calls you to do that. You know, Bonnke's line was that, that he's using a combine harvester in terms of bringing in the harvest. And thank God, Revelation speaks of a multitude that no one could number before the throne. So that's, that's awesome. I, I want to see more fruit, not less fruit. I want to see more people touched, not less people touched. But that in itself doesn't prove anything. God's looking for disciples. God's looking for people after his own heart. And God measures things differently than we measure things. And in all cases, any good that comes out of us is God. In the early 1990s, one of my former students from CFNI, the branch that was on Long Island in the 80s, he became friendly with a megachurch pastor with a big TV ministry and gave him one of my books on revival. And he read it, devoured it, loved it. Got another of my books, loved it, devoured it. And this grad who became a family friend would sometimes visit the church and he had family that was in the church and he called me and said, hey, Mike, he's preaching right out of your books. The other day he was holding up one of your books saying, I didn't know there was anybody as hungry for God as I am. And he's preaching, he sometimes he's reading whole pages out of your book. I thought, praise God, good. He's getting impacted by it, impacting others. Wonderful, glad to hear that. Well then, not long after that, he puts out a book about living a holy life in an unholy world. And I thought to myself, I wonder if it's going to be quoting me because it sounds like based on that book title, there's a lot of my material in my books that would tie in with that. Well, I get a call from a woman, calls our ministry, and she said, Dr. Brown, I basically memorized your books. I'm a pastor. I love your writing. She said, I, I bought this book by so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, it's filled with quotes from you, but it's not acknowledged. In other words, it's plagiarism. He's taking your material quote after quote after quote after quote, sometimes whole paragraphs, and not saying it's you. It's, it's as if it was his. I said, are you serious? So, I mean, it's, it's illegal. Plagiarism is illegal, right? But it's completely unethical, right? I mean, it's no different than me taking your bank account and just seizing it in my name, right? Or you, you write a song that the whole world is singing, and I take the credit for it. No one knows you wrote it. So I... I was not happy to hear that. Sent me a copy of the book and it was indisputable. I mean, especially I had little sayings and plays on words and things like that. And he had word for word, sometimes whole paragraph of my material. And, it, and you're reading, you're just thinking it was him. So I tell Nancy, I said, I can't believe what happened. And I told her, you know how she responded to me? This is the wife that God gave me. And I'm serious. And I could easily just kind of fly off into... She's been this, the joke we always have in our house is she's the lead weight that keeps my helium balloon from flying away. You know what she said to me? She said, I, you know, I told her I was a little upset over it. She said to me, that's just pride. That's her first response. Not, wow, that's wrong, or who does this guy think he is? She said, that's just pride. She said, because you know that he's got a lot more people listening to him than you. And they're going to think that those are his words, and he's going to get the credit for it instead of you. She said, that's just pride. And then she said, and any good thing that you wrote is from God anyway, so why should you get credit? You know, I, 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 I once showed Nancy. I said, can you believe this? By God's grace, I wrote... 300 page book in three weeks. You know her response? She goes, you have a gift. So, you have a gift. That's her response. I was excited, like, honey, isn't this great? She goes, you have a gift. So, like, honey, look at the size of my nose. That's your nose. It just is. Yeah, I'm taller than you. Look at that. I'm taller. What?
Is that a matter to be proud of? It's just the way you're born. So that was her reaction. It's just pride. So I, I went up to our bedroom, got on my knees by the side of the bed, killed the pride, dealt with it, repented of it, went back to talk to her, and she said, I said, it's still wrong. She goes, of course it's wrong. But she didn't care about that. Her thing was pride. If, if God gave, here, if, if I gave you a million dollars and said, hey, just give this to her, okay? You're not like, look at me, I have a million dollars. Look at me, I'm re-. No, it's just hand it to this person. Any good thing you have from God, it's just hand this to this person. It's just like that. Whether it's an ability to make money, whether it's ability to be popular, whether it's ability to persuade people to write, to sing, to speak, to create things, to art, whatever, it's, it's God. He will rejoice with you, and you can have the satisfaction of knowing lives are being touched. That brings great gratification to my heart. But the idea of, look at me. You know the story about the, the donkey that came back after Jesus rode on his back. I don't know if you ever heard this story. It's obviously make-believe, okay? <laughs> Jesus rose on his back, and he, and he gets back to the stalls with the other donkeys, and he's kind of strutting. He's kind of full of himself. And uh, they said, what's with you? He said, didn't you hear today? He said, I, I went walking into Jerusalem, and everyone was praising me. They're all shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. <laughs> and they said, it wasn't you, it was the guy on your back. That's the reality of us in ministry. All praise, all honor goes to him. <clears throat> Listen to what Samuel Chadwick said. The church always fails at the point of self-confidence. When the church is run along the same lines as a circus, there may be crowds, but there is no Shekinah, or as you say in English, Shekinah. There is no real glory of God. Come on, we know how to bring in the crowds, right? Get a real good coffee shop in the front of the building. Dynamic, super entertaining children's program. You don't have to talk about God, just make it entertaining. The right musicians and singers, light show, ambiance. Preacher, come out. You got to have the right outfit on. Whatever's cool, slick, whatever the thing is. Tell a few jokes. That's an inspirational message. You can draw a crowd, and none of it had anything to do with God. You could draw a crowd, and if testing and persecution came, you wouldn't find a single disciple among them. What good is it? Now, listen, I, I'm in all kinds of churches with great worshipers and worship song and, and music and Lights, camera, action, the whole, if that's just a way of getting out to more people and you're doing things with excellence, praise God, right? I, I love, I love just being with your, just chapel, the five minutes of worship to start, hearing these great voices and these great musicians glorifying the Lord, that's awesome. Far better than people who can't sing and can't play. Picture trying to worship the Lord and I'm, I'm the worship, leader. I'm not even gonna sing and kill everything here. <laughs> but I'm the worship leader, It'd be like, Oh. So thank God for good voices. And when I speak, I try to communicate with clarity. You want to do things with excellence. But we ultimately know that all that outward excellence cannot convert a single sinner or set a single captive free. It's the anointing and presence of God that does it. What if we measured our ministries differently? You know, when Paul was boasting about his ministry, he talked about how much he suffered for the gospel. Amy Carmichael, life, lifelong missionary from Ireland to India, wrote a poem called Scar, Scars. And it's Jesus talking to some famous young minister. Somebody that's just become a superstar. Listen to these words. No hidden scar on foot or side or hand. I hear thee sung is mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? 
Yet I was wounded by the archer, spent, leaned me against a tree to die and rent by ravening beasts that can pass me, I swooned. Hast thou no wound? No wound? No scar? Yet as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Can he have followed far who has no wound nor scar? You know, I've been around long enough to see a lot of people come and go. A lot of ministries get exalted and come down. A lot of people become superstars and then unknown. And I don't sit around judging. I pray for the best. I'm not out to criticize and attack. I want to get behind people, encourage and help. And if there's a problem, then we'll address it. I'm not sitting there throwing stones. And if you're called to reach a million times more than me, praise God, I'm cheering you on. If the best I can do is get in the room and pray for you, praise God, let's do it. So I'm not trying to pull people down. There's not a competitive, jealous thing in me. But I've seen a lot of people raised up and you think this can't last. There's no foundation. They haven't been to the cross. They're strutting, not limping. They have no scars. When I was 18, 19 years old, preaching my 13th message, preached to my home church, maybe there are 50 people there at a night service, and it was a real strong exhortation, especially to the young people. Come on, let's get out and do it. It's a wake-up call to the other youth in the church. And they loved it. I mean, the altars were filled and people repenting. And when the night was over, the pastor got up at the end and he, he prayed, Lord, temper your word that went forth tonight. And I was offended. What? So I called to talk to him the next day to find out why did he feel to pray that way. But he was praying the whole day, literally praying for me, I found out. We met the, that next night before another service we were having. And I said to him, why did you feel the need to pray that? And he said to me, you're wet behind the ears. You have no right to speak like that. And I said, well, the young people loved you. He said, they would. He said, but you've got people there that have been living sacrificial lives. They look like nobody. They look just, you know, someone running a little business and raising their kids and you don't know their names. He said, some of these people live so sacrificially. You turn off the lights at a certain point just so they have more money to give to the gospel. You have no idea what some of these people have suffered. You're just a young whippersnapper. You don't know anything. So you realize, okay, you don't want to speak beyond your authority. You know, if you've been on the first missions trip, don't get up and rebuke everybody else because they're not missionaries yet. Right? And, and suffer some rejection, suffer some persecution, suffer some opposition, lose some friends, lose some income, maybe lose some blood, then come and lecture us. That's what she's saying. Look at what Paul wrote, Galatians 6, 17. From now on, let no one cause me trouble for I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Don't argue with me. I've been whipped for him. I've been flogged for him. I've been threatened in every different way. I've lost everything for him. Don't come with all your boasting. Richard Brombond, who is the most famous persecuted Christian of the last century, horrific torture, unimaginable torture and suffering, and his wife in a slave labor camp as well. I was talking to him in 1993, and he he said, you know, when the Iron Curtain fell in Romania, where he was in prison, he said, all these American preachers came over to help the church in Romania and tell us how to do things. He said, not one of them sat us down and said, please teach us. You were in chains for 20 years and didn't deny Jesus. Please teach us. We think we got it together and put this thing together and got, got our packet how to make the thing work. And we leave God out. German theologian Helmut Thielica said, the worship of success is generally the form of idol worship which the devil cultivates most assiduously. In other words, the idol that he's really after is the idol of success and to get us to bow down to that idol. A.G. Gardner said, when a prophet is accepted and deified, his message is lost. The prophet is only useful so long as he is stoned as a public nuisance, calling us to repentance, disturbing our comfortable routines, breaking our respectable idols, shattering our sacred conventions. The idea of a popular prophet is kind of odd biblically. 
So this sums it up, a quote from Leonard Ravenhill. We were real close the last five years of his life till he died in 1994 at the age of 87. Ravenhill said, you take care of the depth of your ministry. God will take care of the breadth of your ministry. You take care of the depth of your ministry. God will take care of the breadth of your ministry. I live by that to this day. Yes, we have team members that work to make sure that we're effectively reaching people and that measure and monitor certain things if we're paying radio bills. You know, we have to run things professionally and honor the Lord and be good stewards. But this, the assignment on me is to be with him. The assignment on me from the Lord is to get deeper in him, to, to know him better, to, to put more attention on him, to get more eyes on him, less eyes on me, to make sure that what we're producing lasts forever. That, that's the assignment he's given me for our ministry. And if I do that, he'll take care of the rest. He'll bring in the right people. He'll open the right doors. I'll say this and close. For many years, people tell me, you'll never preach in this place because you're not like playing the game. You'll, this door will never open to you because you're not like one of the boys. Or you got to do it like this. And I'd say, sorry, God hasn't called me to do that. And he's opened every one of those doors and, and, and put me in all those places. But all those things in themselves are meaningless. What matters is glorifying Jesus. It's not an excuse for being ineffective. It's not an excuse for, for mismanaging and having nothing and doing nothing. But it's to say, let's, let's put the attention in the right place. And anyone can do, any one of you can concentrate on this. You put the roots down deeper. You determine to be with him in a more quality way and draw more attention to him. And God will open every door that ever needs to be opened and give you everything you need to run the race. Amen. All right, God bless you. Thank you for being so focused. And you can meet with Miss Karen right after. I got to run to do some recording, but I'll hang around to answer your questions tomorrow and then Wednesday. See you at 6.30 tonight.